We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. So, good day. This is, um, I'm Jake Block, and this is the session You Are Your Profile. Um, thank you, everybody here and also uh, online. Um, um, before we start, uh, just um, a little thank you, of course. Um, um, uh, Victor, Anna, uh, Carolina, uh, just to um, call you by name, thank you very much. Uh, today's session is about social protection uh, online. Um, uh, I will not go into it at this moment, um, but um, another announcement is that uh, Ger Baron is unfortunately not uh, with us now, but mentally, of course, he is. Um, um, and I would like to um, say uh, something about uh, the moderator of today. So Rosa Lauerse. Um, Rosa will lead uh, this uh, session. Uh, Rosa studied law. Um, uh, she is currently working at internet startup IU. It's a privacy-first communication platform. Um, she's active in the Digital Rights House Foundation. Um, and today she represents the you Are Your Profile Foundation. Rosa, the session is yours. Thank you, Jake. Um, welcome, and also welcome to everybody online participating. My opening. Um, it's an honor to be here on the stage, uh, especially in these difficult times that I can be here in person. Um, and it's also an honor to have a discussion today with you about social protection. Um, but before we dive into that topic with my panelists, uh, I'd like to say some words as well. We live in a growing connected world and um, we are connected all the time on our phones, laptops, and even here today, we are connected. Uh, it's fantastic that we can have a hybrid session, um, but there is a question that needs to be addressed and that's about social protection. Do we feel socially protected online? Uh, when we log on, when we order something or when we chat uh, with our friends or family, are we socially protected? What is the status of our connectivity? And what is the status of privacy? And are we treated with dignity in the online world? Socially, social protection is a challenge as it's not guaranteed yet. And today we have the opportunity to play a role and to participate in creating a society of tomorrow. We have also a res responsibility to explore all elements in society where, uh, for instance, personal data is relevant and how we deal with that as well. We have a choice. We have a choice in creating technology for good. We have a choice in, um, yeah, that we have privacy and we have a choice in creating a an environment that's future proof. We should, we should be able to live in dignity, have privacy, um, and also in the digital world. Today's session, we aim to stimulate you to participate with us as well, um, here in the audience, but also online. And um, but before we start, I'd like to introduce ourselves. Um, we are the Euro Profile Foundation, and we um, our aim is to accelerate answers and to debate future, our future life uh, in the digital world. And the focus is of the importance of person data as well. And I brought with me two other people. Um, you see myself here on the screen and Jake introduced me briefly. But of course, I'd like to uh, welcome Jake and Jerry as well. Um, Jerry, Maybe good to mention, uh, you are a director, a photo photographer, and a communication consultant, and you are a co-founder of your profile. Um, yes. yes, indeed. Um, yeah, I work as a filmmaker, communication consultant, and I find it very important to tell stories that matter. Um, and I'm going to tell that we're going to watch a few items of film today, which we're recording during the confinement, also in the Netherlands. 
So a lot of uh, digital images and things so on. Yes. Fantastic. Um, and next to you is Jake Block. Um, Jake, you are a co-founder of IU. You have your own uh, foundation, the Visual Ways Foundation. You're also a co-founder of Digital Rights House. And you are, um, yeah, let's say, very enthusiastic and you want to do something that we have a dignity-driven society now, but also in the future, right? Exactly. Um, I couldn't say it better myself. Um, I think the fun thing at this moment in uh, my professional life is that you both work on an internet startup, uh, you make something, but um, it's not enough. Uh, you also have to uh, really um, share your voice. So uh, loving being here and uh, this uh, topic of today, uh, social protection online, um, really is um, close to the heart. So let's, uh, let's get started. Let's get started. Absolutely. So what we're going to do today, uh, Jerry mentioned before, we have uh, made a documentary and we're going to show you different fragments of the documentary. And these fragments are also um, yeah, input for our discussions. So we have four topics, um, modern cities and digital citizenship. The first one is actually a warming up. So we do that here on stage. And then technolog technological ethics, human rights and forward considerations. We yeah, invite you also online to participate uh, with us and to discuss these topics. The structure will be that we introduce a topic, then we will watch the video, and then we will start the discussion. So, so the first topic is modern cities and digital citizenship. Um, we all live in an environment that is changing rapidly, as I mentioned before. Um, cities playing a huge role in developing technologies, implementing technologies, and especially the use of the daily internet in our daily lives. Um, and I think, and this video will show you that I think as well, that we, would, that we should be a little bit more aware as a citizen what's happening in, in the world we live in. And um, especially also the question, how can we as a citizen participate in the living environment we live in. Um, the video will go into that, and after that we will uh, discuss the topic briefly. Modern cities. My name is Feveron. I work for the city of Amsterdam as their chief technology innovation officer, responsible for digitalization, digital transformation, also using technology, innovation, digitalization. We're currently at the city archives, uh, which you could say is our hard disk from the, from the past, uh, which is the place where we store well, basically everything we need to uh, have on record from the 17th century up to now. This is a register of people who actually live in Amsterdam as an official citizen, meaning when you're in this book, you had the rights to make use of the services the city had. I mean, probably healthcare access or uh, the voting rights, etc. Hundreds of years we used these books to register the official rights uh, from people in the city. And now we're going digital. Nowadays we work with digital identity, so people have, can on their smartphone can have these rights and they can check into certain services at the city, etc. Um, but uh, uh, the idea is still the same. Privacy is very important for the city of Amsterdam. We actually make a point of this, and I also see a role of the city government to protect the privacy of citizens, because sometimes you don't know somebody is collecting your data, somebody, sometimes you don't have a clue why the data is being used for. And as a government, we should give the good example. In history, we have a lot of data being collected, and obviously there are a lot of examples that data was being misused for people with a certain political color or religion. A second World Group is a terrible example of data being misused and, and Amsterdam still has this scar of the Second World War that we were the city that um, processed the data about who was having a Jewish background within a day. And when you start to really deep dive in into an archive, because it's also about patterns, it's about relations, it's about all these things that... So what I'm trying to say is that privacy is a, is a large scope and it's not only about registering people's names, etc., but it goes way further. So we're here in the Amsterdam Arena Innovation Center. 
This is the place where we actually manage crowds, do social media interactions, and where we get all the information from the area. Uh, we use sensors in parking garages where we actually can see how many people are being parked. This is parking place 18. And then now 15 out of 359 uh, parking lots uh, being used. So these are sensors in the in the in the in the in the in the, in the parking garages. At the beginning, we didn't want to make a big system. I mean, the police has data, the road authority has data, the city of Amsterdam has data, uh, Ajax has data, who, uh, the stadium has data, and who, who the tickets are being sold to, etc. And we didn't want to make a big database out of privacy issues, basically. So we started to work together. There's everybody on his own screen, uh, and just combine data. But hey, I see this, I see this, etc. Uh, and now in this uh, model, we try to integrate a few of the sources basically to get an integrated vision, uh, which we actually uh, only use during events, etc. We don't store the data. Uh, this is real-time data, so we use it for the moment uh, uh, that we need it, basically. And this is also the way we like to work. Actually, I want to like to people to share that data from the car, example given, but only when, when it's needed. And then we want to erase it directly after the event. If you have a lot of data, you need a lot of functions like data warehouse and energies. So it actually has its physical component and also its stress on the fun uh, fundamental uh, infrastructure of the city. If you look to a situation of shock, a shock is an event uh, in which something happens and at once. And most of the times on a certain spot. Let's say, for instance, sea level rise and the seawater is coming in. That's a shock event, like we saw in uh, 1953 in Sealand and in the southern parts of the Netherlands. So actually something is happening and you have to rebuild afterwards. The thing is, for shock events, we are quite well prepared. Everything is, is built on how do we get as fast as possible back to the normal situation. If you talk about stress, it's slowly going on. It's like stress in your own body. It's actually a bit the same. So you see all kind of small events happening that, well, you could say the livelihood in the city is changing. But it's not at once. It's actually an upcoming process. One of the building blocks to, to adapt to stress is that you know what's going on. So be aware so you can act. Digital citizenship. Hi, I'm Rina Smenk. I live in Broek en Waterland, very close to Amsterdam Noord, where we are now. And I'm a co-designer, which means that I try to solve social challenges together with the people that are involved in those challenges. I think there, there is a discussion about technology in cities and uh, how we can benefit from it, but I think it's mostly, the debate is mostly going on in governance and maybe with companies, but we seem to forget about the normal citizen. Yeah, I think at this moment that, that architects and designers do know about what data can bring, that we need it. But I don't think that residents are aware of this. It's not on our agenda yet. I think we should put it on the agenda in every new thing that we develop. Yeah, it's of course logical, I think, that at a train station or at a metro station there are cameras for our safety. But I think most of the times we don't know where they are and what they are doing and what happens to this data. And of course, in a station like this, I think it's normal that we are all being traced because of safety. And I think you can explain that. But in other situations, it might be that you need permission first. So I think it's important that in one way or the other, we explain better what technology can do for a city and for its uh, residents. Uh, and then it might also be easier for people to embrace technology. I don't know if cities or governments should be the ones to protect us online, but I think they should make us more aware that we are not protected online. If you do that with respect and if you listen carefully, 
If you might give them a role which they want, then I think you are doing the right thing. Yes, so we have our first video. Um, we saw elements of how a city uses data and how they implement new technology. And we saw also an element in the document in the video about digital citizenship and how we can as citizens or maybe should be participating in uh, how the city implement new technologies. And, and to dive into our discussion today, uh, you see a first statement. Um, and that is the uh, city needs to be transparent about the data they have from their citizens. It's a yes or a no, and I will give the words first to Jerry. Um, well, yeah, in the, in the documentary, you really see clearly that uh, the, the city needs data, you know, for different assets, for research and everything else. But I feel that as a person, it's, it's, it's important to kind of know what kind of data is gathered by a city and also in what way it's used. Um, I think in, to be informed about that is, is one of your rights. And from there on, you can also maybe have the choice to decide if you want to be, or you want to have some information that's private, for instance. Interesting. So you are saying, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, Jake, what do you think? Definitely yes, of course. But um, yeah, maybe to uh, to go into the question or the, the statement, um, I think when when there's a when we talk about cities, uh, it could be like the government, but it could also be the public domain, right? Um, uh, and if you take that context, um, um, the whole thing is that um, a city, if you say it that way, could play maybe a larger role in uh, protecting us online. Um, but how how to do this? Um, so um, if, if you look at transparency, I think it's very important, in my opinion, is that uh, uh, all the data on me um, it should be um, uh, accessible for me. So I want to know what these organizations know about me. Um, um, there's a conflict there. Uh, because um, there's an argument that this data also keeps me safe. So um, this is a thing that needs to be debated a bit more. Another thing is that it, I don't only want to know what data is uh, collected about me, but I also want to know which data is shared with others uh, about me. So obviously uh, a lot of cities, uh, there was Amsterdam in the, in the video, but uh, if it's a large or a small city, not everybody can really, how do you say it, um, invest uh, by themselves in a modern digital infrastructure of the city. So meaning there's cooperation everywhere, meaning that if there's data collected about me, it's also important to know which data is shared with all these partners, right? Um, and then the third thing maybe is uh, more the notion that um, if I know which uh, data um, is collected about me, and if I know which data is shared with others, you could say, well, um, as long as nothing wrong happens, it's not really relevant or so. It could be the idea. But I think we live in a time that, that's, um, that's uh, traditional thinking. So um, the third comment I want to place just to start uh, this, uh, this uh, whole session is that um, um, I'd really like to know which initiatives uh, cities um, are taking um, to guarantee my protection, social protection online, because otherwise it's a bit, it's a bit fuzzy and it never becomes very concrete, uh, this topic. So a yes for me as well. Then we have two yeses, and I think Jake and Jerry, it's very interesting, but because this is a warming up, uh, I will dive into the second statement uh, directly. And the second one is um, the city can use my uh, the, the city can use data that involves my person data uh, with without my permission. Um, Jake, if you dive into this statement and considering your three points that you made before, how do you think about this one? No. Yeah, I can, of course, uh, but uh, and no, it uh, it has to be based on a permission. Now, the, the, in practice, this is difficult. So, is it giving permission every time, or is it a one-time permission, or is it like sealed? Um, the moment I register to live in that certain city, and um, it's it's that's where a, a challenge lies. So. Um, I personally think uh, I'd love to live in a in a future where uh, 
every time there's a relevant interaction with me, with a person or with some, with a machine that there's some type of like, like something that is not very seamless. I, I like gates. So um, I like the fact that it's very um, clear what is happening with, in this case, my data. But there's a lot of situations that I don't want uh, to be, uh, say, disturbed about this topic. So, but then I assume, assume it's not very relevant. So then again, I'm becoming curious, and I hope the whole world is, what do you do with my data if you don't need it? So this is, of course, a topic. But if you need a yes or a no, uh, let's do the no this time. Thank you. Um, you bring in the element of time, actually. So when when it needs to be transparent, maybe, but when is also a question to uh, need to be asked. Um, Jerry, quick, your... Quick, yeah. Answer. Can the city use my data? Um... I think to align with with Jake, yes, they can use my data, but I think it's important definitely to to give a permission for certain data. Uh, I think if you think about your medical files, other information and so on, if you link back to the film, for instance, with what Ger Baron mentioned about the old city archives in the Second World War, I think we have a horrible scenario. Um, I think today we're speaking about what happens with data and our cities selling your data. And I think there is something that you know, your informations, your data, your person data is flowing around everywhere. And it's a little bit out of control, if you ask me. Okay, thank you. Um, as a close, closing remark for this warming up uh, topic, we had like two yeses and I think two noes. Um, now we will dive into technological ethics and I really invite you to participate on this one, uh, home or here in the, in, in the audience. Um, so yeah, let's go to technological ethics. Um, in the topic before, we saw that we are living in, an, in cities that are changing. And the question arises: um, how we deal with data, how we deal with person data, um, but also maybe how do we as humans should be creating um, new technologies? And the word ethics is about the yeah things like uh, right or wrong, and that question arises as well when we make new technologies. Um, in the next video, uh, you will see two AI students um, that share their considerations and thought with us. And after that, we go back into the statements. And uh, again, if you have a question or do you want to make a statement as well, please uh, participate. Technological ethics. Any technology we have made can be used for either good or bad. It's what you do with it. And bots, AI, anything in that direction is no exception. It is capable of really great things, if, but it can also be really bad. A bot is really a piece of usually online software, that has an ability to interact with a human. Many bots are actually getting smarter because of person data right now, because there are online social networks. Everyone is posting things online. Bots will probably be almost fluent in probably at least English, because it's a really occurring language. They will probably be fluent and indistinguishable from humans. A very advanced bot was called it's a really natural sounding person. People are actually like really liking her. They really think they have like a kind of a new friend that they can talk to. And it's for some people, it's really been nice to have someone to talk to, even if it's not a real person, it can help people. So this is where you live? <laughs> no, no, no. This is uh, the data center. Looks like an apartment, though. Just no not a lot of windows. <laughs> exactly. AI becomes smarter the more data it receives. But data comes from humans, and we always have, we're not objective, so we have a bias in it. And that's what I find concerning, because if you let algorithms take full control, 
and you don't supervise the, the data that it uses and the things it does, it can be, become very, like, vicious, I guess. A nice example of this is a bot named Tay. They had to take it down within like an hour because the people gave it data, but the data they gave it was racist and they turned the bot basically into a racist Nazi within like an hour of it being released. And as a maker, you do have a responsibility to probably take it down at that point. Everyone has like a profile, I guess, out there. Basically everything you do is traced and tracked. So you might think, oh, I have nothing to hide. Well, put all of the data you have together and suddenly they can find out things you didn't think about. We all know what cookies are and it's kind of almost logic nowadays that um, if you Google something or a product, then a few minutes later it's an ad on Instagram. But what we see happening right now is that if I talk to you about getting a new mattress or something, and we talk about it for a few minutes and I go on my phone afterwards, I can guarantee you there's ads for mattresses on my Instagram. And that's just weird to me. It's always listening. And my friends, uh, they do have Siri turned on and then we were having a conversation and all, all of a the sudden their phones light up and Siri starts talking. So that means that even though Siri is not like talking at the moment, she's always listening and picking up on certain keywords and then she turns on. In the future, there probably will be more AI as AI is a relatively new field that there are so much advancements going on. It's grown so much. It's getting more and more commercialized and actually used in applications we have. So it'll be everywhere in the future. <laughs>
So how do you provide um, a technology that supports everybody? The second um, is um, if all these um, developments um, are increasingly um, uh, taking place, then the data will be collected somewhere, stored somewhere, shared somewhere, um, and meaning that developers um, maybe have to keep in mind that it's not only about, say, a functionality that is created, but it's also a solution that is being, um, um, say, uh, unleashed uh, to society, which does something um, uh, directly or indirectly with your data. So the term responsible tech or um, some type of responsibility and, and how far does it uh, reach for developers? Um, that's the second. And the third, I think is very important, very abstract, but I think the whole IGF is about that, is that the moment um, society um, adopts technology development and the pace it's at uh, for all the benefits in mind, um, um, you also have the industry, you have the citizen with a certain role of involvement, uh, yes or no, but you also have the cities and, and say the public domain. And I think that there needs to be more balance out there um, in this topic, uh, meaning that we have to consider giving some control to uh, cities and public domain uh, organizations um, when it comes to implementing and using all these technologies. Uh, otherwise, I see this battle coming uh, between a citizen and the industry, and I think uh, we all know what happened in the last 20 years. Thank you. Yeah, and I think we, if we bring this perspective into our discussion of the statements, um, then we have a first statement. There it is. Um, uh, it always should be transparent what data and AI uses. Uh, to get her results. And I'm curious, Jerry, what do you think of this statement? It always should be transparent what data and AI uses to, to get results. I think that one of the key aspects is, is for people to be able to understand is, is the knowledge about many things. And I think we're living in a time of technological development that there's development is so quick, there's so much happening, which is you're, we're not able to understand it. And I think in this part, that sensitization of knowledge about AI is, is, is key in the importance for people to be able to understand how it your, works. So you're also able to actually understand how you can use it, what the con convenience is, but at the same time also to make choices in what is possible or not. Because otherwise, I think something is happening. People will become maybe suspicious. You don't like it. Oh, I'm afraid of AI. I'm not going to use it. You know, things like that. Um, yeah, so I think it's really important to, to, to sensitize people that there's knowledge and education about, hey, what is AI? How does it work? What are computers? And I think it's also a responsibility of the people who create it, but also of, of cities and governments and other stakeholders to educate about this. Yeah, fantastic. And if you compare it with your uh, input, Jake, if you listen to Jerry, do you have an other perspective to bring in with this statement? Um, I, I think I agree, and uh, but I want to add something, and that is that, and, and, and not only say the knowledge about how stuff works, but also say the uh, insights of uh, what is actually happening. So, and, and it's a lot to consume for everybody, and I don't really know um, um, how far this um, is, uh, say, uh, practically, uh, say, possible uh, if we would want every citizen, every human being uh, to understand this. Um, we love uh, driving cars. Uh, not everybody knows how the car works. We love uh, flying uh, planes or riding trains, uh, depending on uh, where we are at uh, in the sustainability discussion. But um, um, so there's this AI is, is uh, maybe a threatening, but it's also um, bringing a lot of good in, in today's world already. So I'm a technology optimist, um, but that only, in my opinion, uh, is possible um, if, um, if you educate uh, people more. But I find that sometimes a bit um, taking too long, too much time. So it's, it's really a big question how to do this. Yeah, I think so as well. And if you, you mentioned before, if you go to the other uh, statement, we see something that developers are maybe have a responsibility of creating um, um, yeah, techno technology for good. 
and you mentioned before, I think there is also a difference between like creating something and how we are using it uh, in relation to ethics. Um, Jerry, if you if you look at this statement, what would you uh, uh, input be? Well, I think there is there is always a responsibility with something you make. I mean, you mentioned the example of cars, for instance. I mean, if you construct cars that something happens on the road, you know, um, you, you can be held accountable for it. I think if we come towards AI implementing a self-learning program, of course, we dive into a different topic and it also makes choices on its own. So I think we're to stay in the cars uh, paradigm, I think it's interesting because we're also moving forward to self-driving cars, probably also with AI features. Um, so I think in a way, um, when a product is developed, which is bad for health, mental health or something else, and it could be about food or something else, I think we should look at it in a kind of the same way. It's of course difficult, but I feel that definitely if something is created, which is not doing something good, you should be held accountable for it. Yeah, thank you. And I'm very curious if we have some remarks or questions from the audience here or in uh, uh, online participating. Um, we have in the technical room um, online moderators. So I'm curious if we have a remark or a question. If not, then um, let's take this conversation further because I think um, when you're talking about um, um, AI for good or creating something for good, good is, is a word that's also context sensitive. So what, what's good for me can also maybe in your context, Jerry or Jake, is not good. And if, when you look at ethics, uh, it's actually a really difficult discussion. And I can imagine that that context sensitive thing about creating something for good um, yeah, is, is maybe an element that brings the discussion further. Jake, what would your reaction would be on this? Yeah, the only way to tackle uh, this topic, this statement, is that we include everybody. So um, and just assuming that, that um, um, more, mill, mill, more men are developers, uh, I would definitely uh, want more, uh, say, women um, out there as well. And I'm not meaning that it has to be, uh, say, um, the gender card, but everybody. So, um, because then you get different perspectives, different values into the whole decision making. It's very important. Not only looking at um, uh, gender, but also age. I think it's very important uh, that uh, young people, are, uh, the voice of young people is heard more often and not only say, oh, we check the box, uh, young people like it, but uh, maybe um, they, are, they have more affinity with the new technology or are less, say, risk averse um, in the beginning of, um, say, developing something. Um, and uh, so maybe bolder ideas come up. Um, but obviously, saying young people, you also have to address the elderly. And then you also have to address, say, those who are, uh, say, uh, maybe um, um, less able. Um, so responsibility in creating AI for good comes, in my opinion, with inclusivity and diversity. So we are, now have all these uh, UN terms out there, um, but it, it makes a point. And the point is that maybe at this moment, um, 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 and I have two uh, short answers uh, for the statement, maybe the first answer would be that in this moment, it's, um, it's not maybe approached um, very diverse and inclusive. It has to be because there lies, say, the core of taking responsibility. The second layer is also that, um, and that is, I think, the main discussion out there. And I um, also uh, hope that people online um, um, bring in a chat or here in the audience is that um, you can literally ask from a developer, can you um, um, take responsibility in what you're making? I like that as an entrepreneur. Um, but at the same time, uh, the anecdote, um, the hammer, uh, the person who created the hammer, is he responsible for which nails he uh, puts in the wall? Or that a mom or cars or whatever. And um, um, and I think this, um, this is the role for the context where the developer is working. Is it, say, at a large company, uh, at a city, as an independent? At the end of the day, the responsibility lies with all us and processes. And I would here uh, say that in intent, I want developers to take responsibility. 
but in practice, I think um, all solutions go with, um, yeah, through multiple parties and the responsibility has to be lie there. Yeah. Uh, and as, ah, we have one question uh, in the audience. Uh, please come forward. I think there is a microphone. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? I think it's working. <laughs> okay. I believe it's working or you can hear yeah. me at least. Yeah. Uh, I like your term that you are technology optimist. Uh, I would like to say, don't you think in a perspective uh, of centuries of evolution uh, in the whole human history, what happened that we were always deriving laws and laws were always coming in force either on the basis of religion or the basis of ethics or the culture or whatever. And now we are entering into an other era of digitization, that is also a new religion or whatever you call it. And in that, when we are talking about social responsibility or we are talking about that developers are responsible or there should be transparency, but there should also be some kind of law enforcement to protect the people. Everyone cannot drive a car or everyone don't want to learn to drive a car. So the people who still use the digital medium, but they don't know much or they don't want to learn more that how they can be protected. So I think there comes a state responsibility that to protect them. Uh, in this way, how you think like the policy makers should be addressed to safeguard these profiles. Thank you. Thank you, that's a very good question. Jake, do you want to respond on that? Yes, and very and thank you very much for your contribution. And um, yeah, th this is uh, so true. I think. Um, um, uh, um, apologies if I don't have the direct answer uh, for you, but just to uh, complement um, 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 the, the whole uh, statement. Um, what type of society do we do we want to live in now and in the future? And um, if if you look at social protection, it's not only about yourself but also others. So I would say involving more and more groups in the decision-making which technology is implemented in a city could be a way to do it. Uh, I'm not going into the whole, say, um, um, how to do that. And um, some um, governments are maybe more flexible than others, <laughs> if you could say it that way. But the, the whole social protection part should not only uh, lie as a responsibility at the industry or at the cities, but also involving citizens through the whole pyramid. Uh, I think that is one way I would love to look at it in, as a positive uh, note. Thank you. And um, you want... Thank oh. you for your answer. Uh, yeah, you're right that there is a multi-dimension of responsibility in that way. Thank you so much. Uh, I see another question and I really would love to answer that, but due to the time, um, we go first, go into human rights, our last uh, topic in this discussion part. And maybe after that, we can go dive into your uh, question. Yeah, so if we talk about human rights, uh, some words are already mentioned here. Um, we talked about cities, we talked about digital citizenship, uh, but also how to create technology that's uh, helping us in uh, yeah, social protection, but also social protection online. And the notion of human rights is very important. So uh, we dive into now a new video and afterwards we have uh, two statements. Human rights. So I think it's worth mentioning that within the international human rights standards, there is a very strong reference to the right to privacy. It's Article 17 in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It's that Article 17 refers to the right to privacy. Um, no one shall be subjected to arbitrary interferences of privacy, family, or home. And on that basis, there have been other recommendations and guidelines that have been promulgated.
For law, it is important to keep focused on democracy and the protection of the individual people with all the other human rights uh, going with them because human rights are essential things. That is not just a nice paper written in 1948, but it is something all people should know about. I like to quote, but Eleanor Roosevelt said already, if human rights are not happening behind the front doors, it is not worth anything. And the philosophical story says, well, here we are with this uh, rich array of human rights, from very diverse, some of them uh, political, some of them social, some of them individual, which are all listed in the Universal Declaration. Is there anything that can give them a single normative foundation? And the claim is, on some parts, that this is human dignity. If we look, let's say, at, at person data and losing our control over this, do you feel within this context that our dignity might be under a certain type of threat in the online uh, environment? Yes, of course, there is the sheer fact of having the data in people's hands, but there's also the ethical questions about how it's used. What's most disturbing is that uh, what was once thought to be a protection for the individual, namely anonymizing data, is now so easily reversed that um, we once thought, well, it's fine, I've given this survey, but they've taken off my name, uh, they don't have my, uh, have my details of address and date of birth, that's going to be okay. It's quite clear that the technology of modern statistics and AI makes nonsense of that. Make nonsense of that. Um, Jerry, can you share your perspective uh, on this video, um, especially on protecting our dignity and privacy in the digital world? Yes, of course. I think it's very interesting what, what both uh, speakers mentioned in this film, and they also opened up my eyes that in a way, you know, our, our digital world is becoming part of our real being, let's say. And I think that if we're speaking in law terms, as the gentleman mentioned also, what we should do with legislation, um, the, the online world is now also into our homes. So if we, if we conclude that your phone is in your home, then you could definitely say, hey, there's an interruption maybe in your privacy or something else. Uh, to keep it short, I think that dignity is, is, is the fundament of our digital rights and also in a digital world. Um, and I, th I think, therefore, it's very important also to protect our privacy. Yeah, thank you. That's interesting. Also, for the next discussion point, um, it's about privacy protection online. And the, the question is, uh, if privacy protection is the key to social protection online in the digital world, Sure, Jake, your uh, idea of this, your, your choice, yes or no? Uh, yes, and um, short. Um, 75 or so years ago, there was a declaration, Article 1, dignity, um, freedom, etc. Uh, Article 12, privacy. Um, in a digital age, in a more connected society, Article 12, I believe that Article 12 would be part of Article 1, um, say um, this year, um, if if we would write the declaration now. So let me explain. Um, in a connected society, um, uh, your data is everywhere, uh, meaning that if you do not have a tool to control it somehow, uh, like M Michael Rosen said, um, at that moment, um, uh, your dignity is under attack. So without tooling for privacy, no dignity in a connected society. And hence, I think it's a key for social protection online. Thank you uh, very much for this st statement. Uh, we had a question in the audience. Um, yeah, please come forward and um, ask. Hello, uh, my question is for Jerry. Uh, I'm a content creator and YouTuber. Um, you 
people, when people hear about AI and privacy and tech and cryptocurrencies, their knowledge is based on fear. They hear about these tech things when they hear about Cambridge Analytica and data breaches. Um, and you talked about the responsibility of cities and uh, creators of tech to inform people about technology and their digital rights. But we didn't talk about the responsibility of media or filmmakers or content creators to inform the public. Uh, a great example is uh, the Social Dilemma movie. And it's a documentary, but it's not just a documentary, like uh, a hard uh, documentary to consume. It has that drama uh, side of it. So it was uh, for the general public. My question is, do you think that the media or filmmakers or content creators are doing enough to inform, to inform the public? And what are the next steps to um, make these notions uh, knowledgeable, knowledgeable for the public, not just for experts or people who know the tech? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for this question. I think I think the reasons that we're making this film and we're working now on a new one as well about personal considerations is that I definitely feel it's very important to tell and to make media um, about what drives people, what drives people to develop AI, what it means. And I think there's a, um, a definitely as a, as a content creator, as a filmmaker, maybe even as a journalist, there's a responsibility in your job to also speak openly about what's what's made. We heard something in our little lives. echo. I yeah. think it's gone. Yeah, but thank you very much. I think it's really important to uh, to do so. Yes. Yeah, and um, he's asking as well, what's our next steps? But if we dive into also our second statement, we can maybe uh, um, uh, bring it forward. Because the second statement is also about how we can all play a role. And I think that's also your question. How can, for instance, the media or content creators play a role in making people aware? Um, Jerry, if you touch that briefly in this context. Yeah, I think step one is continuing and I would like to invite all filmers and data makers to, to continue telling those stories. Um, I think, how, how do we push it forward? Um, the problem is often that in this type of media, you know, it's, it's not to sell something, it's about awareness. And I think that creating content for awareness is important and something we need to keep doing. I think also that to be not judgmental helps. So I think we should appreciate that what's good you know, the, the positivity about it, but at the same time also be critical about it means for one person. Um, I think also that's why you or your profile as a foundation, the, the, the you is central in everything which is digital uh, online. You are becoming your profile. And I think this awareness is something we need to write about, speak about and continue doing this. Thank you. And it brings us to, um, as a closing remark, um, I think we touched a lot of things today, like uh, from cities to more like the technical parts to eventually human rights. And uh, what we like to do now in the last five minutes as well is to look into our future. Uh, we call it forward considerations. And first I want to ask um, Jake, your <laughs> here you are. Um, like let's say in half a minute, your uh, forward consideration for the future. Um, half a minute, so um, this is definitely possible. Um, my, the context uh, th that my answer is in is that uh, we now live not in an internet for information, but an internet for interaction, meaning that uh, it has long been surpassed that the reason we go online is for information, but it's more and more also that we interact. So all the solutions um, that we are seeking are solutions that involve everybody that has access to internet, meaning there's a challenge to, to give everybody access to internet and educate them. If I go into what the, um, uh, you just said in the audience, um, I would say that um, everybody is this creator, so it has to be aware of what, um, uh, what uh, she or he is sharing. My statement in short is that um, um, I think that um, if there is something out there like fake news or fake information, how do you tackle that if there's also fake identities? So I, I would like to seek a future in where people take responsibility that when they go online, it's authenticated, that you know who it is or 
it's anonymous, but then that way you also can validate the information that is shared. So it's like an indirect approach to making it a more clean internet. And I'd, I'd, I'd view, uh, I would tackle say the digital identity topic before the digital say information uh, topic. Thank you. And Jerry, what would your perspective for the future be? I think if we look at human rights online, um, education and knowledge is important. And I'll keep it very short. I think we should start to think and to talk and to debate about our digital rights in, in the world. I think it's something which is step by step happening, but I think it's something which is very, very important, and not only for the Western world, I think also for the greater South and other parts of the world where soon everybody will be connected. Thank you. And as a closing statement, I'd like to say also some words uh, for today. I will walk to my thing here. Um, as we saw today, uh, in the different elements we discussed, you can say social protection online is not guaranteed yet. It's a challenge. And um, we all have the opportunity to do something about it. Um, I, my ideal world would be that we have a world where our privacy is protected, um, our dignity is valued, and our basic human rights are also guaranteed also in the digital world. And I think today we started a conversation here at IGF where we discussed these things briefly, um, but my uh, last words here would, would say an invite, an invite to you all to play a role in shaping the society of tomorrow. Because I think we are um, yeah, writing the future every day with our decisions and actions we make. Um, so having said that, we will watch one other video and then uh, we're coming to an end. Forward considerations. The things you do, the things you say, the things that make you the specific human being you are should be yours, not some data that can be used by any company. Yes, in the future it would be wonderful if, let's say, you and me would own our own data and that we can decide who are we going to share it with and if we are we going to do it for free or are we going to charge the company that is willing to buy our data. Human rights standards also need to evolve with new questions about ethics um, and new prospects for laws to protect and ensure human freedoms. I think internet should have uh, all kinds of rules to protect the users. What is your right over your image? Those are things which will demand rethinking and reorganizing legal systems in ways which really we haven't even got close to. On the short term is 30 years from now in my perspective, that's 2050. As a city we are climate neutral, we are climate adaptive, data safe and we are of course a circular city. Do we need a data governance board on a global level? And my answer would be, yes, we need that. On balance, uh, you know, I think computers have transformed our lives uh, in wonderful ways. So yeah, um, uh, and balance between hope and fear. balance between hope and fear and I think that we come to that we are here now uh, to thank you um, thank you very much for participating in our session uh, first of course thank you Jake and Jerry uh, to have this discussion here on the stage but also to everybody um, participating in their homes uh, thank you and I hope you will have a great day today uh, it was an honor to be here on this stage and I enjoyed it uh, very much and hope you we uh, have a discussion pretty uh, soon. Thank you.